Hello, I'm Paul Crosthwaite. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of English Literature at the University of Edinburgh, and I have a particular research interest in the relationship between literature and economics. This talk draws on research for the History of Financial Advice project. Uh, this is a research project funded by the British Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, in which the Library of Mistakes is a key partner. Professor Peter Knight from the University of Manchester, who's also spoken in this series, uh, is one of my collaborators on this project. The project as a whole covers the period from the early 18th century to the present, and it looks at how ordinary people through history have learnt about and tried to make sense of financial investment and the workings of the stock market. The project focuses in particular on the investment advice manual as uh, an especially important genre of popular financial writing. It's a genre which first appears in the mid-18th century and of course remains very visible and popular today. In this talk, I want to highlight some examples of this genre from a particularly tumultuous period in US financial history, the decades either side of the Wall Street crash of 1929. During the 20-year periods culminating in the Great Crash of 29, ownership of common stocks in the United States increased around 30-fold, peaking at between 15 and 20% of households. Throughout the period, lay people keen to try their hands at Wall Street speculation were amply catered for by an array of investment advice guides. The majority of these guides offered versions of what's called technical analysis, that is, tools for identifying indicators in financial prices themselves, rather than so-called fundamental analysis, that is, financial analysis geared towards the underlying conditions of individual companies or the economy at large. And regardless of their affiliation with technical or fundamental analysis, all of these guides were invariably indebted to the ideas of one man, Charles H. Dow co-divisor of the hugely famous Dow Jones Index of leading stocks and founding editor of the Wall Street Journal. The so-called Dow theory was a body of ideas drawn or extrapolated from a series of columns written by Dow for the journal between 1899 and 1902, the year of his death. Crucial to Dow theory, as it was popularised in the 1920s, was the idea that the stock market was a barometer of wider economic conditions. This idea was the key concern of William Peter Hamilton. Hamilton was a protégé of Dow's, uh, and he edited the Wall Street Journal himself from 1908 until his death in 1929. Hamilton's book, The Stock Market Barometer, published in 1922, anticipated quite strikingly fully-fledged academic theories of the efficient markets by several decades, in asserting that the price movement represents the aggregate knowledge of Wall Street and, above all, its aggregate knowledge of coming events. For Hamilton, the stock market was a barometer rather than merely a recorder, because in discounting everything everybody knows, hopes, believes, anticipates, it did not represent what the condition of business is today, but what the condition will be months ahead. A function of prediction that it performed, he said, with almost uncanny accuracy. As efficient market theory would later emphasise, the idea that the stock market is consistently right tends to exclude the possibility of any systematic method of outsmarting it. Presenting something of a problem for a writer purporting, at least in part, to offer practical guidance to the would-be speculator. Thus, while Hamilton is intellectually committed to the idea of the market's omniscience, he conveniently admits that major bull markets and bear markets alike tend to overrun themselves, thereby leaving open a window of opportunity in which shrewd operators might act contrary to the crowd and end up with a profit. Here we can see one of the key ways in which investment advice contributed to the so-called New Era ideology of the 1920s, according to which the US economy had undergone an epochal shift in its capacity to generate and sustain prosperity, meaning that stock prices 
could quite reasonably reasonably be assumed by the end of the decade to have reached a permanently high plateau, in the infamous words of the Yale economist Irving Fisher, uttered in mid-October 1929, mere weeks before the crash. The investment advice genre arguably fed the mood of the speculative boom of the 1920s in deep and structural ways. One factor that has plausibly been cited to help explain the over-escalation of share values in the period is that investors had been misled by exaggerated claims and inadequate disclosure of the true financial position of corporations, as Carol Simon puts it. Certainly, the architects of the New Deal were convinced that this had been a critical problem and it led them to mandate company disclosure and reporting requirements for new issues and traded securities as part of the regulatory legislation introduced in the early to mid-1930s. One of the reasons that technical analysis predominated in the period prior to the crash is precisely that the kind of detailed information about companies' earnings and book values necessary for thorough fundamental analysis was often not publicly available. In insisting that access to such underlying information was in fact unnecessary, since it was always already priced in by a stock market barometer that, if not infallible, was very close to it, and thus in advising investors to focus instead on the eddies of asset prices themselves, technical analysis therefore helped to foster the indifference to the actual health of firms in the real economy that fueled the boom. As Janice Traflett has described, the Great Crash of 1929 severely damaged public confidence in the stock market. The shadow of 1929, as it became known, was long. During the Depression, Americans showed little sign of willingness to invest whatever meagre savings they may have had in stocks, and as late as 1952, only about 9.5% of households held any common stock, compared to that 1920s level of 15-20%. to 20%. Writers of investment advice faced a challenge to re-establish their credibility following a crash whose extent and duration had flown in the face of conventional wisdom. Even as the long bear market continued, the Dow Jones would not bottom out until mid-1932, having sustained a staggering 89% loss from its September 1929 peak, even during this long downturn, Dow theorists in particular were putting out books that sought to reassert the validity of their approach in the wake of the crash. Humphrey B. Neal's 1931 book, Tape Reading and Market Tactics, is especially revealing in this regard. Neal adopts various means to persuade readers, who may have been deterred from involvement in the market by the crash, that they should not abandon speculation. Much of Neil's discussion of the crash is given over to emphasising its anomalous and exceptional status. The market fell through a supposed resistance point, that is, a previous low that would in theory tend to check declining prices, without a flicker in late 1930, he tells us, because the market was greatly changed in that year, and the entire situation was different in all respects and could not be compared to conditions the previous year. Similarly, the great bull market of 1928-29 to 29 was abnormal in its intensity and it is quite unlikely that we shall witness the like again for some years. We should not be surprised that the boom and bust seem to contradict some of the prevailing assumptions of technical analysis, Neil implies, because such analysis deals in typical price movements and, he is at pains to stress, Prices between 1928 and 1930 were anything but typical, rising and then falling far further than a technical analysis approach premised precisely on the power of precedent, old highs and lows, to curb movements would expect. At the same time, if there's a lesson to be drawn from the mass participation bull and bear markets that the nation has just lived through, then, for Neil, it is that the emphasis that technical analysis had always placed on market psychology as the factor that tends to push prices past their true values at the tops or bottoms of trends needs to be accentuated still further. He writes, The fact that during the past eight or ten years 
millions of people have bought stocks for the first time must be considered when we are trying to estimate the ebb and flow of stock prices. And he goes on to hazard a forecast. More attention will be paid in the future to an interpretation of human nature as it is affected by economic factors than to the economic factors themselves. Rather than a turn to fundamental analysis, therefore, the boom and bust years should lead the speculator to double down on a market philosophy that stresses market psychology, in Neil's words. A reaffirmation then, not a repudiation, of one of the core tenets of technical analysis. Even by the mid-1930s, though, technical analysts were increasingly being challenged by a fundamental analysis paradigm that was gaining greater visibility, legitimacy and prestige. Readers of investment advice were being given increasingly plausible grounds to believe that fundamental factors weren't, in fact, always priced in to the market, and that it might well be possible to identify over- or undervalued stocks through close examination of information pertaining to the health and prospects of particular companies. This was thanks, in large part, to the investment advice written by Benjamin Graham and David Dodd. 1934 Security Analysis by Graham and Dodd is the key statement of their philosophy of value investing. The book is very clearly presented as an attempt to learn the lessons of the speculative hype and excess of the late 1920s. As they put it in their preface, we have striven throughout to guard the student against overemphasis upon the superficial and the temporary. This overemphasis is at once the delusion and the nemesis of the world of finance. Graham and Dodd's mantra, instead, is that of intrinsic value, what a stock is really worth once all of the hype is stripped away. Graham and Dodd argue that the intricacies of corporate accounting and financial policies provide the security analyst with unbounded opportunities for shrewd detective work, for critical comparisons and for discovery of potentially profitable information about a company. The role of the investment analysis analyst then is to be something of a detective, ferreting out the hidden information that will give them an edge in the market. The book's publication coincided fortuitously with legislative changes that considerably expanded the range and depth of, of information available to the, the security analyst. There was more of the kind of information that they needed in order to perform this kind of analysis. As Timothy Jacobson describes, the New Deal financial regulatory regime mandated the disclosure of an abundance of previously privileged corporate data. Especially important here were the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, both of which required companies to make public information that they previously had been able uh, to uh, keep to themselves. By the late 1930s then, Amateur investors had both the potential, if not always necessarily the time or resources, to access the kind of information necessary to thorough fundamental analysis. And systematic guidance, with the help of the likes of Graham and Dodd, to the best means of methodically investigating such information in search of indications of a profitable discrepancy between price in the market and the intrinsic value of the stock. And they could also work step by step through textbook taxonomies of the characteristic technical patterns supposedly displayed by stock prices during their periodic ups and downs. So they could both style themselves as a fundamental analyst or a technical analyst. Yet the contradiction that technical analysis had always identified in its fundamentalist rival that it was futile for the amateur investor to try to sniff out new information because the market would always have got there first, only seemed to be deepened by the new transparency and availability of business information. If all of this information was out there, how are you to know that you're the one that's going to be able to find it and make use of it? Surely somebody else would already have done so. Meanwhile, the central contradiction of technical analysis that, its precepts, that if its precepts work consistently, then all market participants would adopt them, 
nullifying their efficacy, was more acutely apparent than ever. In the 1950s and 1960s, university research in financial economics under the rubrics of modern portfolio theory and the efficient market hypothesis would place these contradictions under remorseless focus, presenting challenges, but also new opportunities for writers seeking to school the public in how they might, if not beat the market, then at least reap the benefits of its supposedly infinite wisdom.